it's even more updated now from what it is. This shows you all the major cities on India's coast, on both sides, east coast and west coast, and shows the extent of inundation by the sea. And as you can see, half the cities are gone. Uh, by 2050, these are predictions, but by 2030, if not half, 20% uh, will go. The Climate Central website has animated features. You can look at 2020, 2025, 2030, you can look at animated sequences, etc., which will show you uh, what's going to happen. But then you also have impacts which have soft limits. Soft limits means it's reaching danger point. But you can still do something through various technical and socio-economic, etc. measures. And this shows you some of the impacts that we have seen in India. First is extreme rainfall, where you get rainfall of 200, 300 millimeters in one day, while it might be the average of getting that much rainfall in one month. And this happened in that photograph you see on the top that Vinard. Uh, the latest disaster uh, there. On the first day, you have got about 130 millimeters of rain. Second day, you got 270 millimeters of rain. Over two days, it had crossed 500. Right. That is there. The next two photographs you see are from Himachal uh, Pradesh. Landslides bringing down whole mountain slopes. But the important thing in all these, including Myanmar, including Himachal, are that. Climate impact is extreme rainfall, but half the damage that you see is not the extreme rainfall alone. It is human habitations are built there. Those big townships are built where the land is going to come down. So if something happens, so many people will die. Road construction is done in a wrong uh, way. The mountains are unstable. There you go and build road. So it's human error compounding the climate. Uh, danger. So there is something that you can do <laughs> there. Two other issues I will highlight. This shows you urban flooding. This is a picture from Chennai uh, during the 2019 uh, floods. And these floods again, you have extreme rainfall, but the extreme rainfall falls on the city scale, which has got uh, poor drainage. Poor in the sense, this is drainage designed. 80 years ago, so you've got a pipe which is 25 centimeters in diameter. It can't handle 150 centimeters, millimeters a day. You require a pipe which is 90 centimeters, 90 uh, cm across. There's nothing to do except create new pipes, which is what is being done, done in Chennai. Chennai already spent something like 4,500 crores in new drainage uh, systems. Still not enough, still more to be done. No other city has done anything like that. That is one problem. Second problem is the city itself is built in such a way natural drainage lines are blocked. Rivers and streams which could clear the water, they are blocked. They are not able to carry the water uh, anywhere. Road construction, natural drainage, they are blocking all the streams which can carry the water. So you built a city which is bound to flood. So water stands up in here. The storm water drain cannot clear it. Obviously you are going to have floods and it will happen every year. So every year you will incur, incur 10,000 crores of uh, economic losses. Forget about loss of life, loss of productivity, etc. This other photograph you see here is a heat map of Chennai. This shows you you have what is called the urban heat island effect. You have concretization of the city, which absorbs the heat, radiate it back. If you had soil, like in a farm, it would not happen. It would happen because you have concrete roads, you have concrete buildings, you have flyover, etc. All concrete plus. You have what is called waste heat. Waste heat means this air conditioner. As much cooling as it does inside the room, that much heating it is throwing out into the environment. Automobiles, cars, factories, machines which are running, all are generating heat. That adds to the heat. It's estimated that in large cities like Chennai, Delhi, Mumbai, etc., roughly 4 degrees Celsius temperature is higher 
in the city area than in the surrounding uh, hinterland. This is urban heat island effect. So if you've got a heat wave and temperatures are reaching 46 in Delhi, we had that this year. In the middle of the city, temperatures actually in Delhi is slightly different because Delhi has all the green areas in the middle of the city, not in the surroundings. So in the surroundings, you had the urban heat island effect more than in the heart of the city. They had crossed 50 degrees. So in the three problems I've highlighted, extreme rainfall leading to urban flooding, leading to landslides and collapses and further damage, and to heating, to extra heating effect. So uh, I just highlighted these. Uh, I don't need to go into detail. We can see those. Where does the world go in this? Uh, TG touched upon some of these. I won't go into too much of the argument. Uh, the summing up I want to do is we have just had what is called a global stock take. The Paris Agreement had mandated that between 22, 2020 and 2023, a three year period, all countries, uh, agencies will sit together and assess. Every country has made a pledge. That's the NDCs, the nationally determined contribution that will cut our emissions by so much. Every country has said that. Where do we stand now after all these countries have said we have taken stock of all that and while the target is that we should reduce current emissions by 40% by the year 2030, we are far short of that and we have a gap of about 14 to 15 gigatons, that's a billion tons of carbon dioxide which we still need to cover and which we are nowhere near uh, doing right now. So all countries are going to get together again in the next two years. By middle of 2025, every country has to submit the third revision upwards of their NDC. And India also faces that problem, which is why I posed it here. So India has to move towards its next uh, submission of what we will do. So some mitigation options I've discussed. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Very briefly, let me put it like this. India's NDC has three main points till now. First is to reduce emissions intensity, meaning ratio of emissions to GDP. We have said that we will reduce it by 40, 45% by 2030. This is our target. Actually, we have already almost crossed it. So it is like a train schedule saying we'll cover uh, Chennai to Bangalore, uh, we will reach in uh, six hours, knowing full well that your train can do it in five hours, and then you say, great, we have reached one hour early. This is what we have done here. So we've got a lot more room that we can cover. We can offer more, that's one. Second is, we have said that we will have 50% non-fossil fuel <laughs> electricity generation. Non-fossil fuel, not renewable. Non-fossil fuel means it includes large hydro and it includes nuclear uh, also. This again, we have almost already reached mm -hmm. the national electricity uh, plan of India says we will reach 57% of installed capacity by the year 2026. Whereas we are promising only 50% by 2030. So here again, there is scope uh, for more. Third is forestry. I don't want to spend time on this, it's a complete nonsense claim by the government because as we all know, in one pretext or the other, forests are coming down. Instead of forests, you're having monocrop plantations, tea plantations, coffee plantations, palm oil plantations, all are being shown as forests in India's uh, forestry figure. To the extent India was asked by the UNFCCC to resubmit its forestry figures because it was rejected by the government. Uh, body to complete fraud <coughs> what is happening in the name of office. So I won't spend more time on doing that. I think that there is a good argument people will have saying, why should India do more? The job is that of the developed countries. They are not doing, they are saying you do, you do, India should do, China should do. That's the correct argument. What I am arguing and we have been arguing this for a long time in the AIPSN and Delhi Science Forum in particular that we should use this as a leverage to bargain with the developed countries. Saying, you do much more than what you say. If you do that, we will do this. 
put it in the table as a condition that I am prepared to do this if you do. Uh, and there are some options that we have which don't cost us anything, low risk options. One is energy efficiency in buildings. First announcement by the new government was 10 million new houses under PMAY. If you are going to build houses anyway, why not make them energy efficient? So that you require less air conditioning. Make the building energy efficient, you will reduce AC load. If you reduce AC load, you reduce need for electricity. You reduce urban heat, it has a lot of benefits. And you will gain. If you don't, every building that you build today has a life of 50 years. For 50 years, you have locked in that much carbon and you have locked in that much energy inefficiency. You keep using extra electricity for the next 50 years. So why not invest now and save money over 50 years? That's one option. Second option is to increase public transport by a huge amount so that you reduce the number of personal vehicles on the road, which will reduce heat and uh, reduce fuel consumption. Uh, as well as promote equity uh, in society. And the third is waste. We all know urban waste is a big problem. Municipal waste, which also produces the dangerous methane gas, which is 20 times worse than carbon dioxide in terms of global emissions. We can tackle that without too much additional problem. That is as far as mitigation. I am arguing for, and this is part of the campaign I'm suggesting, that all this we will be talking about mitigation. That's what PG said in his introduction. I think it is time, at least in India, to shift our emphasis to adaptation and to impact. What has been done has been done on emissions. We have got some suggestions. India can do more. But I think we need to shift the dialogue because nobody is doing anything on tackling climate uh, impacts. What has been done on extreme rainfall and drainage? Nothing. In Maharashtra government, Big announcement was made that they will spend 450 crores to tackle uh, problems in Mumbai. 450 crores you can spend in one day in a city the size of Mumbai and it won't do anything uh, at all. Central government, Chennai has spent 4,500 crores, central government has offered 350 crores uh, to Tamil. So unless the central government comes in in a big way on this, you can't tackle this problem. There is gradually going to be a movement in the international negotiations anyway to ask countries now, apart from NDC, <coughs> to start submitting a national adaptation plan uh, also. And I think we can do that. So, having said that, I now will come quickly to our campaign uh, proposal. TG, how much time do I have? Uh, now it is 30 minutes. So, I have 10 minutes, huh? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I want to present this camp based on what I have discussed uh, so far. As TG was saying, we have been doing a lot of talking about emission reduction, uh, mitigation action, India's NDC. We have done a lot of work. In fact, we have contributed in a big way to shifting government policies, at least the earlier government policy, uh, not so much on this one. But we actually had results then. However, while we have discussed this, our activists have learned a lot, but it just seems to be a very little opportunity for the mass of our activists to get involved uh, in the campaign. It's a very technical subject. How many people will understand if I reduce efficiency? What will happen? Very difficult for the activists <coughs> activist to get involved. Now, the issue of climate impacts has come in such a way that we can actually evolve a campaign which will involve the mass of our uh, activists and I'd like to suggest that. I've already presented this just like this camp in the camp held in Delhi for the so-called Hindi speaking states, which is a misnomer. <laughs> because it also includes Maharashtra and Punjab says don't call us if you are having a crap for uh, Hindi speaking, right? we are not Hindi speaking. So, but anyway, for the uh, groups who feel fairly comfortable with Hindi, that was from, I presented it there. Yeah, so uh, this is what I was saying earlier, that uh, 
कितनी सुंदर आंचल है why this thing is reading and that we can now uh, do something powerful which can enable mobilization of the uh, bulk of our psm activists now what is this campaign that i'm suggesting this is an outline the first is that we focus on extreme heat and heat waves why do i suggest this because this affects the whole country the extreme rainfall will happen in a b c d place but extreme heat takes place throughout uh, the country and we've seen that every year it starts around february march in the southern states and then gradually moves upwards middle uh, april it goes in the middle of the country by may june it goes to the north and covers the whole country uh, there by which time the monsoons uh, start we can also add other campaigns the western ghats the himalayan regions uttarakhand himachal the northeast regions these can add the problem of landslides which is linked to extreme rainfall those groups with working in towns and cities can again take up the problem of extreme rainfall and urban flooding along with the heat uh, areas other states can look at agriculture also and we are seeing this as a multi dimensional campaign we will involve the health desk on health issues because heat has obvious dimensions on health the agriculture desk comes in because of the possible impacts on agriculture so uh, all the desks also can get involved and the activists associated with those will also get involved because these are their subjects uh, as well along with doing the campaign we will also then raise awareness about climate change see rather than talking about emissions which happens globally uh, global negotiations which is taking place somewhere <coughs> the average activist think hey, what am i going to do about this some discussions are taking place in paris so what can i do about this they are sitting there and listening yeah yeah very good point you are making but what can i do this is something where he can actually do he or she can actually do something involved but why we do that we are starting with the symptom the problem of extreme rainfall problem of heat problem of flooding rather than starting from the top and coming down we are starting where it hits the average person in the stomach as they say and then talk to him why is this happening and go upwards to the root of the problem and why we do that we can also press for adoption of a national adaptation so uh, what could be the possible activities uh, of this campaign first is to study you know every state has developed what is called a heat action plan every state has one there is guideline formulated by the national disaster management agency which has then sort of been adopted modified etc and come to the states the states have got uh, state heat action plans many districts also now have district they have their limitations we can come to that later but that is our problem as a psm group we have to identify this is what the government says they will do if, if uh, heat wave is there we will initiate heat action plan but what they will do what are the limitations what does it say can they can it be looked at differently there are many points on that we can uh, discuss those later second is ground level intervention as i said this is what the government says they will go say we have already published a heat action plan but what does it actually say leading advice in the heat action plan is stay indoors not everybody can stay indoors construction workers need to go out and work manual laborers need to go out and work domestic uh, maids who go domestic work they have to go to ten different houses in the sun so staying indoors is not a solution and if you are staying indoors in a crowded slum area you are likely to be even more affected by the heat than if you go into an open so there are many problems with that but the leading problem is it's been drafted by the national disaster management agency ndma is geared to handle disasters earthquake has come people are dying buildings are collapsed so you rush some soldiers there you rescue the people and come away heat is not like that heat is eating away at you it's a slow burn uh, problem lasting 3 weeks 4 weeks 5 weeks it's going 
that requires a very different kind of operation, not a disaster type operation. It has to be looked at very differently. So PSM groups can get involved in that. In the day, we'll talk about this uh, later. If you all remember during the COVID period, our groups actually intervened at the grassroots level. Sundar was, uh, was talking about this earlier. We intervened at the community level. We identified people. We helped them get their supplies and provisions, taking them to get uh, vaccinations, etc. Et we can do those kinds of intervention at the community level itself with regard to heat, while we also interact with government, with the health department, with others who are supposed to activate in the level of uh, then we can ensure or move towards protection for construction workers, uh, other manual laborers, what can be done to protect them from the extreme heat. One of the guidelines, for example, is can we say construction work should be stopped between 2 and 5 p.m. 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. construction work stops, shaded areas are provided, workers go there, drinking water is there, then they can come out and continue from 5 till 8 o'clock when the weather is cooler rather than work from 10. This is a guideline, but it is not compulsory. Can we push it to make it compulsory, make sure it happens, etc. That's something that we can uh, do. And then we can work towards advocacy for long-term measures. These are not covered in any heat action plan, particularly can we do anything to reduce the urban heat island? I told you it raises temperatures by 4 degrees. Can we prevent that? Can we make sure that in a city temperature does not rise by more than 1 degree? What are the measures required for that? Greening of the areas, having more water bodies, having permeable uh, surfaces rather than reflective concrete in the buildings. There are many measures which are possible and what all can we do uh, about that? This is the urban heat island again. I just want to draw attention to one thing, which is the, it's called a heat index uh, chart. Why I'm talking about this is, in India we define heat waves in terms of maximum temperature. If temperature crosses 40 degrees Celsius, and if it is 3 degrees more than 40, and it lasts more than 3 days, then heat wave. Then heat wave is declared, then immediately disaster management agency comes. But if temperature drops 2 degrees, they will all go back saying this is no longer heat wave. So we are saying don't just talk about heat wave, talk about extreme heat. <coughs> and what a heat wave does not take into account the Indian definition is humidity. We only talk about 40 degrees Celsius. This map shows you uh, what is called a composite, it is a heat index. The combined effect of heat and humidity. I will give you an example of Chennai. Uh, city. For whole of uh, April this year, temperatures in Chennai were lower than in Delhi. But if you take humidity into account and take heat index, 28 out of 30 days Chennai was hotter than Delhi because humidity is combined. Average temperatures in the month of April in Chennai was 37, 38 degrees Celsius with humidity more than 60 which then brings it close to 40 plus uh, degrees of high humidity, which is classified by the World Health Organization as close to human survivability limits. We are actually talking about limits to human survival. When you take high temperature plus humidity into account, this is a very dangerous, toxic combination that we are dealing with, and that needs to be dealt with in our systems that we are uh, talking about. So this is the heat action plans, these are various gaps in the heat action plans. So responses, this just shows you some possibilities of, the can see there, drinking water provision for construction uh, workers, shaded walkways, uh, just with trees on top or with shade netting, where children go to school, for example, or where open air markets are held. Simple measures which don't cost much money, which can help people to cool down uh, and work. Uh, these things can be done. Provision of ORS at strategic places, especially where there is more pedestrian traffic, uh, etc. Can heat be reduced? Yes. Through more green cover, urban forests, various things. And if you do these, it can help in absorbing carbon dioxide, in 
cools down, it reduces air pollution, and it improves health and well-being. So there are multiple benefits that you will get by doing this. One other issue, the lady there was asking for temperatures in the hall to be cooled down because she felt the air conditioning was set too low. In India, we are not conscious of this at all. In fact, we like air conditioners to be set low because we think, hey, when it's hot outside and if I feel cold, that shows how comfortable uh, I'm getting. I come from Delhi and in Delhi, people actually say, when I was growing up, we didn't have any of this air conditioner, nothing like that. Now I have. So let me enjoy it. And I enjoy it when temperature outside is 45 degrees and inside the house I've got a blanket over me and I'm shivering. Then I think, ah, now I'm enjoying uh, the air conditioner. If you go in any Shatabdi, Rajdhani, whatever train, you'll find the same thing. People, the ladies come in with shawls because it's so cold. This is not just um, a problem. But it's a huge problem. And the reason I'm saying that is, suppose our temperatures normally in ACs here are set at 20, 21. You can set it to the thermostat. All of you have remotes at home, I'm sure your AC, you'll be setting at temperatures. Most homes, they set it at 21, 22, uh, like that. It should be in there are countries where in Shanghai, in Seoul, in Tokyo, they have made it a rule all government offices, all commercial buildings, you cannot set your AC thermostat less than 25 degrees Celsius. You must keep it at least at 25, if not uh, more. If you do that, you will save money because your AC is working less, so it consumes less energy. You save money, it will throw out less heat, so it contributes to lowering the urban uh, heat. So, we want a big campaign to be done with government, with commercial buildings, with middle class homes saying reduce your thermostat, uh, raise your temperature in the thermostat. I am not asking for any great sacrifice by people. I am saying save energy, uh, save money, save the planet. It's a win-win-win uh, situation if you reduce it. We should make this into a mass movement as well as convince the government to do this. But incidentally, the power ministry has actually issued a circular this year advocating this and they are figuring out whether to give it, make it compulsory in buildings, etc. Uh, etc. Et and if you can do that, it's very good. Encouraging exchange of old ACs with new energy efficient ACs. Can you believe in Delhi, it's a private electricity distribution company. It's the probably only surviving company run by Anil Ambani uh, group, which is actually working. That company is offering its customers to exchange their old ACs and take new ones. Uh, with the company offering EMI. Why is the company doing this? Because Peak load in the summer in Delhi this year was 8,500 megawatts, which the company has to pay money to Punjab, Uttarakhand, Himachal to buy at premium prices. This way, if the peak load can be brought down to 7,000 watts, then 1,500 megawatts they save money. That's why they're doing it. But again, it's a win win. They also win, we also win, the planet also wins. So we should be looking for solutions. Uh, like that, and this is one of the major uh, and to ask you. Thank you very much.